All right, folks, we're getting high today. Recently, Bootstrap Farmer has announced our 30-foot round and our 20-foot Gothic. We actually have three different sizes of Gothics. The reason I say 20-foot specifically with the 30-foot round is both of them have a working height at the peak of around 16 feet, which means at least 18 foot of working height to put these things together. And so in this video, we're going to be talking about renting and using a personnel lift whenever working on a hoop house. We know a lot of people general day to day, they're not renting big pieces of construction equipment. They don't know the process and I wanted to go through that with you. Uh, a little bit of background, I owned a bucket truck for several years, did a lot of tree work in my past life. I've got a lot of time in lifts, and so I wanted to just share a few tips about working in these things, about the rental process. We're going to talk about the four most common types of lift with some pros and cons, uh, some general safety hazards and things to look out for, and then we're going to show you some hoop house specific construction tips from our last 20 foot Gothic build. So getting right into it, the process to rent a piece of equipment, you want a good, solid, reputable place that you can trust that does great service on their equipment and is going to be available for you for uh, any tech assistance that you may have. Now, if you're thinking, well, I don't wanna spend the money on the lift on one of these higher structures, you know, think about it like this, the bigger the structure that you do, the more production you're going to have. You know, it's not just the cost of the kit, but it's the labor to put it up. It's the cost of moving the utilities to the structure, like water, electricity, that kind of thing. And in this case, renting a personnel lift. And so, you know, most folks, they'll have like an eight foot step ladder, sometimes a 12 foot step ladder, sometimes a 24 foot extension ladder, but you really can't use a, an extension ladder on a structure that is not tied down. I mean, you, once the hoops are up, you can't really just lean on this thing and then expect to work on it at the same time. And I know some places will also rent a taller ladder, but man, after dragging around a heavy ladder like that with a, a very tall working height, plus constantly being worried about falling off of it, having somebody else there to hold it up, constantly dropping stuff and having to go up and down the ladder, move the ladder. I mean, you're going to be hot, man, by the end of the day. So it's really time to just think about, you know, going ahead and, and doing the expense of renting the lift. I know some of you folks are out in the county and may have a little bit of a drive, but it's, it's just something that you're going to have to build into the cost of building this. And then I know. I know, believe me, that there's other ways to get this done without renting lift. Recently, our friend at Seed for the Nations in Springfield, Missouri, they have a bunch of buses and they were able to use that bus. I personally don't have a problem with it, but as a company, we can't sit here and tell you, hey, this is a, a sanctioned way to do this. This is uh, very much on you to take responsibility for your own safety, your employees' safety, and to build this thing as perfect as you can. And I have certainly been accused of doing some sketchy stuff while building some of these things and, and other projects throughout my life. And yeah, you can get it done, but uh, it just takes one time to really mess up really bad uh, before we all regret these decisions. Our lawyer is in the corner shaking his head at me, so I'm going to get right back into uh, the topic at hand. So back to uh, dealing with a rental company. Find yourself a company that has the type of equipment that we're looking for. Understand the terms of the rent, whether it's by the day or by the hour and talk to them about renting it over the weekend. Sometimes it's a little bit better to have it on a Saturday and Sunday, a little bit cheaper rates. You don't have to get that thing back. If you have all your ducks in a row, even with a hundred foot structure, if you're ready to go and you've inventoried everything and the weather's great, two days, you're in and out, it's perfect. I think for this 20 footer, uh, we had it for three days. So you may wanna budget that. And then having things like you know plenty of spare batteries for your power tools, you know, that's certainly going to save you the time that you need. The other thing to consider is talk to the rental company about recharging the batteries. Uh, a lot of these work off of electrical hydraulics. You're going to be using this thing all day long. You know, plan to take a break for lunch and to charge that battery up a little bit. As soon as you get done with it for the evening, make sure that thing is charged up and ready to go for the next day. Next, when you show up at this rental shop, you're going to see several different types of lifts. And so let's go over the four most common ones that you're going to see. I'm going to preface this whole conversation with a lot of the times you have two options, all-terrain or a slick tire version. The slick tires are, go are going to be what you see uh, at construction sites that are working on a slab. So by and large, you guys are going to need to insist on getting the all-terrain version. All four versions that we're fixing to talk about, it's common to have this in that all-terrain 
So if you have to choose one over the other and the deciding factor is the tire, go with the all-terrain. Even if your soil is nice and smooth and compact around the area, you never know what's going to happen. You're going to have to go out and around the slab for the end walls, so have those all-terrain tires. All right, now on to the lifts. First one we'll cover is your scissor lift. And uh, hey, vertical farm folks, you guys love your scissor lifts. Vertical farming companies love to uh, put these things in renderings, but this is not a rendering. This is the real world. We're getting stuff done. Pros and cons of a scissor lift is out of the four pieces of equipment we're looking at, it's going to have the biggest working platform. So think of anything like two and a half feet wide to four foot wide and six to eight foot long. These things are really nice to work in. There's a ton of room. I would really like to see you guys get one with stabilizers. And the stabilizer basically comes down and puts downward pressure on all four corners in addition to the tires to keep this thing from swaying back and forth. That being said, on all four of these lifts, you know, there's there's a point as you start working on this that you're getting used to it. You're you're seeing about the speed of the hydraulics, and you get up to the working height, and it's it's going to move just a little bit. It's it's always it's always going to flex. These lifts are designed to flex a little bit, uh, but there's a little bit of motion sickness involved. And the, the, I've worked on some really tall lifts, like 50, 60 feet, and there's times where you just kind of pause and be like, "Whoa, man, a human's not supposed to be up this high." But these things are over engineered. And at the working heights that we're going to have to do here, you're going to be just fine. That also being said, I'm sure that whenever you have it out there, it is fun to kind of run them up as far as they can go, take your pictures or whatever. But again, 18, 20 foot, it, it's going to sway a little bit, but it's not going to be too bad. So the problem I have with the scissor lift is the same problem I'm going to have with the next two that we're going to talk about is the weight. So anything other than the trailer mounted option is not only going to have the hydraulics and the lift itself, but it's going to have some type of engine or drive mechanism, whether that be electric or gas or propane. And it's all this extra machinery that almost more than doubles the weight of what a trailer mounted boom lift would be. So if you're thinking about your site prep and the dirt that you've had to bring in, or maybe you tilled it up, or maybe you, who knows what you'd have done to site prep this thing, but just know that some of these working weights, you're most likely going to compact anything that you have going on or you're going to have to bring in some additional uh, filler material to fill in some ruts. And so we have this, and I'm gonna go a little bit more into depth with the weight here in a second. And the scissor lift, it, it's, it's real straightforward. You go up, you go down. There's not a lot of side-to-side -side movement or anything like that. So my suggestion is if you're working on the end walls, put it parallel with the end walls. And if you're working inside of it, like you're putting up your uh, purlins or your ridge poles, that you run it parallel with the length. And so you're going down the length of the hoop house and you have a little bit of runway to go back and forth to put up your purlins and your ridge pole. Now, these articulated boom lifts and the telescopic boom lifts, they do have smaller baskets, but they can go side to side, which on the 30 footer, I really don't think you're going to have enough width working in the basket if you're running perpendicular along the side along the house to put all of them, which means three trips up and down the length. Now, you could do it if you turn it but then you don't have enough room to do all your measuring and pulling the bows in and stuff like that. And so with that and the weight of it, the scissor lift is not my first option. Number two, an all-terrain articulated boom lift. Now a boom lift will have two arms that go up and will let you move side to side. I really like this action. I like how maneuverable these things are. But again, with the separate drivetrain, my only problem with this is the weight and so the same problem that we have with a heavy scissor lift, the all-terrain articulated boom lift just weighs so much more. And I think you're going to sacrifice having to do more groundwork or extra groundwork once you're out of there or even before it. Uh, the next one on the lift that you'll see out there is an, an all-terrain telescopic boom lift. This is a single arm that basically goes inside of itself and can either go out or in. It will move side to side. I like the articulated boom to go up and over the arches, especially uh, pulling on your plastic or putting the verticals up on your end wall and doing the final attachments up tall. So these two are real close first and second. But again, you have that separate drivetrain. Most of these are four wheel drive, which adds more to the weight. And so for that reason, if you have the choice, a trailer mounted boom lift is the way to go. You don't have the separate drivetrain. It's easily moved with even a, a smaller truck or an SUV and you can drive it in 
the tunnel and around the tunnel when you're finishing up the end walls, no problem. It's got that articulated boom and most of them also telescope up, which means you can work all the way around the end walls. You can go side to side and put up purlin kits and your ridge pole all at the same time. Now, most of the smaller ones that you see is a 35 to 38 foot, and then another, the next step up is around a 50 foot. And I'm telling you, you can really get the smallest one they have. Even if the smallest one happened to be, let's say, 24 foot, that's more than enough working height to do any of these structures from us. Now, let's take a look at the weight. The trailer-mounted boom lift, uh, we use Genie. I've, I've, I've got a ton of time in Genie lifts, and so I know them really well. That's the one we rented locally, and these are the pictures that we got from uh, genielift.com with some of their specs. So take a look at that trailer-mounted boom lift, 4,400 pounds. You also have to include the weight of your vehicle, but the weight of both the vehicle and the trailer with the boom lift on it is equally distributed, and you don't have, as you can see, the scissor lift, 7,672 pounds, the all-terrain articulated boom lift, 8,024 pounds, and then worst of all, is the all-terrain telescopic boom lift at 13,544 pounds. This doesn't include the weight of your tools or the one or two people that you're going to have up in the boom with you. And that's something else you're going to want to take into account. When putting up ridge pole, it's really nice to have two people up there with you. So make sure that the working limit is at least 500 pounds, depending on who you have working with you. So once you are at the rental house and you've hopefully picked out a trailer mounted boom lift, which I'm telling you, they're really common. The only reason it may not be there is if somebody already has it rented. So if you if you do plan on doing this on XYZ weekend, make sure that you're scheduling this thing up far in advance and then playing around with the weather if need be. These rental houses are used to uh, jobs being canceled because of weather. You're not going to hurt anybody's feelings. So don't worry about that. Just something to be uh, mindful of. As you go through the documents, you, know, you may have to, I'm sure you're going to have to show some insurance on your vehicle. You know, they're not expecting you to be boom lift operator experts. So make sure that they spend the time with you uh, going over all the safety measures. Uh, a lot of times these things won't go up in the air unless all the stabilizers are engaged and the parking brake is set and that kind of thing. So if, if you get on the job site and something's not working, more than likely it's because a safety mechanism is not engaged. So make sure you go through all of that before you leave. A lot of these things have a key. So make sure that if if it does require a key to operate, that you, you either have that key or it's attached to there permanently. If you're not used to towing trailers, you know, maybe take some extra time there or get somebody to do it for you. They're going to show you how to hook it up to your mount. Most likely they're going to need a two inch ball. Some of the larger lifts, if a smaller one isn't available, you may need a two and three eighths. So don't show up without making sure that your vehicle isn't, even has a receiver hitch on there to tow something like this. And then hopefully they'll plug in the lights for you and all that will be working and you won't have any trouble. So I also should say that if you don't have a, to a towable lift, that the scissor lift, the articulated boom, and the telescopic lift, you have one of two options. A, they're going to deliver it and pick it up for you, which is nice because you don't have to deal with all the transport. And B, they may rent you a trailer, which is an additional fee on top of that, but they're also going to charge you a fee to deliver it. Again, you're saving a little bit of money going with the trailer mounted and doing that yourself versus having to either rent an additional trailer or schedule them to come out and pick it up and all that kind of thing. And remember, if they do charge by the hour, just because they haven't picked it up yet, that contract may have ended as far as how many hours you're allowed. So be real specific to are they charging by the hour or by the day. All right, moving on. Most common safety hazards. There's anything and everything can happen when you're up in the air or working on a job or moving across town, anything like that. But here's the ones that are pretty specific to lifts. Falling. Everybody's scared of falling out of these lifts. So just stay in the cage. Sometimes they will provide a harness. More times than not, they won't. You know, if they have it and it makes you feel more comfortable, great. If they don't have it and it makes you feel more comfortable, they will rent you one or they may just let you borrow one and they'll show you how to use whichever one you wind up getting. Slow and smooth operations, and then don't overextend when you're working on the hoop house. It's real easy to do. You know, the, these things have safety cages with rails, so it's real easy to, you know, I just need another foot and step up on the rail. Don't do it. Use the machine as it's intended. Let the machine take you to the work. Don't be crawling over to the work. And then <laughs> there's no reason for this, but I had, I got to include it. Don't take a bucket or a small ladder or something like that and put it in the platform to get extra height. There's no reason that you would ever have to do that, but hey, I'm trying to trying to cover all bases here. Second thing, and I think the most common thing that would happen is I really suggest having a, a spotter, somebody that's sole job is to, when you're moving, 
making sure that you don't crater the hoop house in some way. I mean, look, this is a new piece of equipment. Probably haven't used one before. It's real easy to get one of those boom arms or telescopic arms caught up in something if you're swinging around or anything like that. It's real easy to, uh, as you're backing in or driving through, you know, to miss a corner. Just go slow, go steady, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Everything will work out. But if you have somebody else on the ground that's kind of helping direct you or calling something to your attention that you may or may not see, because you're working on the 360 degree axis. It's not just right or left and up and down. It also turns. So you have all these (laughs) different ways you can run into stuff. So with that person on the ground or with other people doing other activities around the hoop house, I promise you're going to drop something. Ideally, everybody has a hard hat, but I know you, I know you, what you got going on over there. And and most likely that's not going to happen. So just be extra careful when working under or working in there that you're kind of conscious of who's around you. And if if somebody's in your way, tell them to scoot on out the way. And speaking of dropping stuff, we're going to cover this in another slide, but I'm going to bring it up twice. You're going to drop 5 million screws when you're up there trying to put the ridge poles and the purlings and the vertical bars for your end walls up. Something happens when you're up in the air that gravity just sucks the life out of anything that you have in your hand. Hopefully you don't drop your drill, but as you're dropping all these screws, you know, get yourself one of those big mag- magnets, you know, swing it over the ground, get all that stuff up. You don't want to be tilling or working your soil years from now and still finding these self-tap screws and carriage bolts and nuts. Uh, anyway, the next one, tip over. A tip over is so unlikely, but it can and does happen. So make sure that you're engaging all your safety measures, including wheel chokes, stabilizers, and don't work in storms. Don't work in high wind. If your ground is overly saturated, it's not too compact. Uh, I'm not so much worried about it on the on the towable lifts, but uh, the scissor lifts, I don't know, man. They kind of turn my stomach a little bit. So just think about how wet is that soil, how loose is the soil. And one other thing about the towable lifts is is there is a, a small thing where, oh, it's attached to the truck. It's not going to tip over. Well, most of the time you have to engage the sta- stabilizers before it even runs anyway. But I- even if something happened and it's bypassed or something, I'm not saying people bypass these things, but they bypass them. Put the stabilizers up. You're going to feel better. It doesn't take that much extra time and you don't have to worry about tip over. Lift collapses. Lift collapses different than a tip over would be a catastrophic total failure of the lift while you're up in the air. This is why I want you to use a rental company that takes care of their stuff. And if you have a question or a concern, you call them immediately. But even if you had like a hydraulic line break, there's uh, safety mechanisms built in, where, in here in which it's not going to fall down. I mean, you're if you have a lift collapse, more than likely you have done something so crazy that it's, it's not the lift's fault. So I put that on there just to bring it uh, to your attention. But I also put it on here to just say, you know, if as long as you're using this thing responsibly and, uh, and how they directed you to, you're going to be just fine. My bucket truck from back in the day, Uh, That could have been a lift collapse. That thing was old and rusty and busted, but we're still here. Next thing, electrocution. So we have built a hoop house before the 30-footer. You may see it in some of the footage where an electrical line does run right over the top of this thing. Sometimes you can't help it. Uh, If you're working on the end walls and there's a utility pole around, just be aware of overhead cable lines when you're up in the air. They're real easy to miss. If, If they're on site, you know, make sure that that spotter is helping you look out for that. Just be real careful about it. This one, the next one, probably going to happen at some point in a collision. And sometimes the collision is just a little bump whenever, uh, you know, you may run into a rib or something like that. The hoop house has enough flexibility. The lift has enough flexibility. It, it may just be a little reminder for you to, hey, take it easy, be a little bit more careful. But uh, you don't want to run into anything and enforce the issue. So keep a light finger or keep a light hand on whatever controls that you're operating And any collisions, if you do have, should be pretty minor. But just, it's real easy to run into things. You know, this thing's moving around left, right, up and down, and in a circle. And most of the time, the platform itself will move up and down or side to side. Just be aware of it and uh, go a little slow. And then the one that I worry about the most, probably for no reason, is pinching. Look, this machinery, it it's it does have the ability to loose clothing or a piece of uh, body part just hanging out. If you're operating the lift, stay in the cage. Don't be hanging out. Don't keep a hand rested on a boom or anything when you're uh, moving it around. You should be just fine. Also, keep your ground people away from the machinery as it's moving around. Uh, they don't. They shouldn't have their hands on anything as it's moving, but 
that's just a, that's the thing I kind of worry about the most. All right, moving on to hoop house specific tips. You know, in this picture, uh, we're we're working in the hoop house. The tele the telescopic the telescopic boom on this unit that we're in, uh, which is a genie unit, is going to go uh, up and out and back down. So what we did is we is we learned to park uh, the truck and trailer a little quite a bit ahead of the work because the boom went out, I would say 10, 12 foot at least. And so we were able to get two sets of ridge pole and purling up uh, every time we moved. That's why it's so nice to have that uh, uh, type of machine that can go left and right as well as up and down and out. But every time we moved, just keep in mind that you're going to have to lift up the stabilizers, get in the truck, go forward, put the truck in park, put the parking brake on, set the chokes, put the stabilizers back down, get back in the bucket and raise up. Now, that gets a lot quicker the more you do it. The less you have to move the unit as a whole, the better off you're going to be as far as saving time. Next, this is a picture of me up in the boom. Uh, not working very smart here. I, I put this on there for a reason. I mean, I'm like I'm like working at a really odd angle and just it's so easy to do because you, you park the lift somewhere up in the air and you work along a section. And then you find yourself like, why am I working at this angle? So just keep in mind, you also see a ladder there. That was for our ground personnel to help bring us stuff that we dropped or pieces of uh, of the hoop house that we needed to install. So you still need a ladder on site. This picture, I, I was just hoping to convey a little bit of, you know, this thing is going to go from the very bottom of the screen up to the top of the screen, working on the purlin. And then when it's in the center of, this, of the hoop house, it has the ability to go up. Really nice for those guys to work in. And these exterior shots like this, this was all done with drones, so we didn't have another lift or anything but just another perspective of you can see that those those stabilizers fit perfectly within the confines of the hoop house as we're working in it and of course you want to do this stage you shouldn't have your end walls up anyway but just keep in mind you're going to put the ridge pole and the purling up before you do the hoop house so it's going to be open on both sides this was a, a real tight space uh, between the hoop house and the chicken coops you can see that road you can also see the little working road uh, between a hoop house and the crops on the other side. So it was pretty tight turns. Uh, and even with that longer truck and the boom, still able to get to it. No problem. Hey, tape measure. God, dude, I can't. Tape measures, man. Always have. I think you need about 30 tape measures on a job site. You're going to take four of them up there with you. You're still going to be looking for ones. But in all seriousness, do take a couple of extra uh, tools with you when you go. Some extra sockets. Put them in a box. Don't be shuffling all around for them. Uh, you're going to use a lot of tape measures, especially when you're setting the hoops four foot on center. But here's a picture of, again, our friends in Springfield, Missouri, Seeds of the Nation Farm, where they have built a wooden jig four foot on center. And we will be getting that footage here shortly and having a little uh, how-to tip coming up. So like and subscribe to this channel so you don't forget some of these tips that we have coming up from these bigger builds. Next one, this is uh, me not following safety protocol and, and taking a picture directly under the the cage when it's up in the air but i uh, did it so i could show you all those little holes all those little holes are where all those five million screws are going to fall down from so keep a box with you that the bag of screws is in i also like to have a pouch on my waist to have the screws to eliminate up and down up and down all day long work smarter not harder be efficient but all of these platforms have some type of drainage holes in there all that stuff is going to fall through have that magnet ready uh, to pick up anything that you drop and again this picture shows how narrow this basket is it's pretty tight with these uh, two grown boys right there but we're all pretty well fed over here but still got the job done still comfortable enough uh, you are shuffling around on the ground a little bit with the box of extra screws and whatnot but it's, it's still plenty of room and it's narrow enough to work on the peak of the Gothic for sure, and especially the 30-footer. And I love this picture because it shows how important it is to have the working height above the peak. Now, this is after we had dropped down a little bit to the left, but having the ability for one person to really stretch out that plastic and the other person to up there uh, put in the spring wire, you can see how tight that we got. I've never had plastic so tight on a structure before, and it was because we had the ability to work above the working height made all the difference in the world. And again, narrow road. You can see the electrical fence for the uh, chickens there. Still had plenty of room. One thing to keep in mind, you may, you may want to take a look at how wide those stabilizers are to make sure that's going to fit inside of your area. So that's it. You know, there's, there's a lot to, to be said about having that uh, extra air mass that we talked about in the previous video. 
Uh, but it does require some extra work and it does require the extra expense of renting a lift. But don't let it intimidate you. It's really not that bad. The money you save by renting versus the aggravation that you're going to face by crawling up and down a ladder, or doing dumb stuff like I tend to do and crawl on the back of it or crawl on the front end loader. It's uh, I'll tell you this. Working in a front end loader, not only is it dangerous and shame on me, but hey, you're here to learn from my mistakes. But this was so much faster and so much better. We didn't have to overextend. And uh, I don't know. I just don't think I'm going to do it again. So hopefully all this helps. Again, I said it last week. We've got a ton of really concise tips and tricks for hoop house buildings coming up uh, well into the next year. So go ahead and subscribe. If you have any comments, questions, you want to yell at me, put them in the comments down below. Don't forget to follow us on social at Bootstrap Farmer across all platforms. And hey, we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.